story that, that Darnell told us about was David was already king and conquering, conquering his um, surrounding enemies. Um, but if you remember, before David became king, the king was Saul. And Saul had a son named Jonathan. Jonathan and David were best friends. And um, they <coughs> very close relationship. Um, and um, even though Jonathan was the king's son, everybody knew that David was going to be the next king because David had been anointed by the prophet and he was going to be the king. Um, and so it happened that in one of those battles, King Saul and his son Jonathan were killed in the battle. And so David became king at the same time that he lost his best friend. Um, so during, during, um, during his reign, David became a great king. He um, followed the Lord. His heart was after God. David was conquering his enemies and his kingdom was growing. Um, he had people who were against him, but um, he was always victorious because God, was, God had put David in this place for this season. Um, and, and David eventually became famous. It wasn't like, you know, I mean, think about it. Israel was a tiny little nation surrounded by big nations like it is today even. Um, and David was king of Israel, but, um, but he became very famous because God was with him and because he was victorious so much and because his kingdom was, was growing. And uh, one day, I don't know what happened, um, something tripped in David's mind. Maybe it was Jonathan's birthday or maybe it was you know, an anniversary of one of their adventures or something. But, but one day, Jonathan had this thought. I mean, David had this thought, um, I need to do something in honor of our friendship. I need to do something to honor Jonathan's memory. So that's the scripture that we're going to read today in 2 Samuel chapter 9. If you want to turn there or if you want to look there in your Bible app, um, I'm going to read from, I'm going to read this from the message starting with the first verse. This is one of those stories that doesn't get talked about very much. 2 Samuel 9, verse 1 says, One day David asked, Is there anyone left of Saul's family? If so, I'd like to show him some kindness in honor of Jonathan. It happened that a servant from Saul's household named Ziba was there. They called him into David's presence. The king asked, are you Ziba? Yes, sir, he replied. The king asked, is there anyone left from the family of Saul to whom I can show some godly kindness? Ziba told the king, yes, there is Jonathan's son who's laying in both feet. Where is he? He's living at the home of Maker, Maker son of Amiel, in Lodabar. King David didn't lose a minute. He sent and got him from the home of Maker, son of Amiel, in Lodabar. I love these names. <laughs> Thank you for being named Tammy. I can say that one. Um, <laughs> when Mephibosheth, yes, that was Jonathan's son's name. Let's do a whole sermon where we get to say Mephibosheth over and over and over. Verse 6, when Mephibosheth, son of Jonathan, who was the son of Saul, came before David, he bowed deeply, abasing himself, honoring David. David spoke his name, Mephibosheth. Maybe just to make sure he could say it. <laughs> <laughs> Don't be frightened, said David. I'd like to do something special for you in memory of your father, Jonathan. To begin with, I'm returning to you all the properties of your grandfather, Saul. Furthermore, from now on, you'll take all your meals at my table. Shuffling and stammering, not looking him in the eye, Mephibosheth said, Who am I? You pay attention to a stray dog like me. David then called in Ziba, Saul's right-hand man, and told him, Everything that belonged to Saul and his family, I've handed over to your master's grandson. You and your sons and your servants will work his land and bring in the produce, provisions, 
for your master's grandson. Mephibosheth himself, your master's grandson, from now on will take all his meals at my table. Ziba had 15 sons and 20 servants. <coughs> all that my master the king has ordered his servant, answered Ziba, your servant will surely do. And Mephibosheth ate at David's table just like one of the royal family. Mephibosheth also had a small son named Micah. All who were part of Ziba's household were now the serv servants of Mephibosheth. Mephibosheth lived in Jerusalem, taking all his meals at the king's table. He was lame in both feet. Have you heard that story before? No. Wow. Um, so, David has decided, in, to, in order to honor the deep friendship that I had with Jonathan, and um, in his honor... I'm going to take his son in as my own. Basically, I'm going to make sure he's cared for. Mephibosheth was only five years old when, when Jonathan died. We read that later in Scripture, that um, he was just a child. So um, Jonathan was probably there when he was born. He probably knew the whole story. Um, but he had become king, and in becoming king, you know, the, the former king's family, obviously, um, didn't have any benefits. They, they didn't have a pension like, you know, if you're a president or something now, you would keep getting paid after you're out of office. Um, but, so he was obviously living somewhere less desirable than when he was the grandson of the king. Um, and so David decided, I'm going to give him all the land that belonged to Saul that I acquired when I became king. All the land belongs to him that was Saul's personal property. And, um, and Saul's, the former king's servants, are now going to be Mephibosheth's servants. And um, so in, in all this time, you know, over the years then, Mephibosheth came and and while he had his own place, he still came and had his meals at the palace. So he had the king's food, he had the best to eat. Um, a very different way of life. You know, like, um, like you hear people on TV all, always saying, you know, if they, if they win $10,000 or something on a game show, this is going to change my life. Like $10,000 might change your year. Um, probably not going to change your life because I don't know too many people that handle money well enough um, that ten thousand dollars changes their life. But anyway, maybe it could happen. But that's kind of what happened here with with Mephibosheth. I wish I had a nickname for him. Um, so what, Mickey? <laughs> anyway. So now his life has changed. David goes on his business. You know, he's, he's still the king. Um, David had a, an actual son, a birth son named Absalom, who turned against him, who decided he wanted to be king. Absalom, David's son, um, really was well liked by the people in the kingdom. They... <coughs> He persuaded many of them that he should be king. So he started battling his own dad. David and Absalom were fighting against, well, they weren't fighting against each other. Absalom was fighting against David. David had the place uh, in, the, in the kingdom, um, but Absalom was trying to overthrow him. So what David did, since, uh, it's a long story, we're not going to get into all the details, but David ran. David took some of his men, and they left him. Um, they went to a place to hide from Absalom, um, and while they were there, the people in that community didn't like them and started throwing stones at them. And, um, and, and, and all of that, David, um, David knew his place. He knew his identity. He knew that he was where he was supposed to be because God had put him there. Um, and I hope you're listening to this story and drawing some parallels for your life, too, because it's true for you, too. There are lots of times when people that, even people that we love, come against us and, and um, are, seems like they're just trying to take us down. But if you know your identity in Christ, if you know 
where God has placed you and who he's called you to be. It'll help you to stand during those times. Um, so, so David did that. He said, he, he told his servants, don't, don't bother with the people who are, who are coming against us. God may have told them to say that for all we know. So, so his servant, here, this servant who David has given to um, Mephibosheth, Ziba, was that his name? Ziba. Mm -hmm. Ziba, okay. Um, Ziba comes with supplies for David and his men while they're in hiding. And he comes and he brings him all these supplies. And, and David says to him, thank you for coming, thank you for coming, bringing these, but where is Mephibosheth? Now think about this. David has taken Mephibosheth from poverty and brought him into the palace, given him servants, given him land. I've done a lot for you. Now why aren't you on my side, right? I mean, I know you've never thought things like that. But um, <laughs> I helped you out now. I'm in need. Yeah. So, so David says, where's Mephibosheth? And, and the servant basically told him why. He said, well... He's still back at home because he thinks since you're not here and he's the, the king's former king's grandson, the people will put him back in the place, in your place as king. So basically try to drive a wedge between David and Mephibosheth, right? Does this make sense? You got the story? <clears throat> so, so David comes back home, things turn around, he comes back home, and when he comes back home, Mephibosheth is there to greet him. Um, David has in his mind that Mephibosheth has been back here the whole time on basically doing the same thing that his real son is doing. Absalom is trying to take the kingdom. Mephibosheth wants the kingdom. Everybody wants the kingdom, but God said it's mine. So when he comes back, um, in chapter 19, 2 Samuel chapter 19, I'm just going to here to tell you what happened. Um, it says, after David had come back to, to Jerusalem. Next, Mephibosheth, the grandson of Saul, arrived to welcome the king. He hadn't combed his hair or trimmed his beard or washed his clothes from the day the king left until the day he returned safe and sound. And the king said, Why didn't you come with me, Mephibosheth? My master, the king, he said, my servant betrayed me. I told him to saddle my donkey so I could ride it and go with the king, for as you know, I am lame. And then he lied to you about me. But my master the king has been like one of God's angels. He knew what was right and he did it. Wasn't everyone in my father's house doomed? But you took me in and gave me a place at your table. What more could I ever expect or ask? That's enough, said the king. Say no more. Here's my decision. You and Ziba divide the property between you. Okay, so David comes home, he, he finds Mephibosheth waiting for him, saying, that was a lie, what he told you. Now David doesn't know what to believe. Who's telling the truth? Was it true that he was back here trying to become king, or is it true that, he, his, that Ziba um, lied about this? So David says, just divide it between you. You take half, he can take half. And Mephibosheth said, let him have it all. All I care about is that my master, the king, is home, safe and sound. <clears throat> now think about the story. Mephibosheth, it says, didn't comb his hair, didn't trim his nails, didn't cut his beard, didn't comb his hair. From the time David left to the time he came, he must have been a mess by the time David got back. But it kind of tells you who's telling the truth in the story. Nobody who's trying to become king is going to go around without combing their hair or trimming their beard or their nails or <laughs> washing. That's, so obviously he was the one telling the truth. Um, and then when you listen to his motive and you listen to his heart at the end of the story, he says, if you want to divide the property between us, that, I don't care anything about the property, he can have it all. I'm just glad that you're back. All I want is that you're back safe and sound. Now that kind of sounds like something that his father might have said. Don't you think? If you know the story of David and Jonathan, how close they were, their friendship. Um, all I care about is relationship. What I care about is that um, you are okay. You matter. The property doesn't matter. 
The throne doesn't matter. What matters is you. Um, man, does it sound like a friend you have? Do you have a friend like that? That can encourage you just because you matter to them? Somebody that really knows how to speak to you, how to encourage you when you're having a rough day, or somebody that's just there. Um, I don't know. I guess some of us probably don't have people like that in our lives. Um, okay, so Darnell told us the definition of encouragement, which means what? To encourage. Okay. Um, <laughs> What did he say? To put courage in. Thank you. To put courage in. Um, when you encourage somebody, you put courage in them. You, you give them um, the ability to do something that they couldn't have done a minute ago before you were there for them. Like, I don't know, you probably know instances where people have showed up for you just in time when you really felt down and then the next minute there they were and that person um, just something they did or something they said or just the fact that they were there made a difference so that you were able to do something or believe something or hope for something that you were desperate for before they arrived. We all need those kind of people in our lives. We all need to be those kind of people to the people around us. Um, so I wonder, you know, I, the Bible doesn't tell us what happened to, to cause David to think about Jonathan's family, but I wonder what would trigger, what would be a trigger for you? What would happen to you that would cause you to think, who could I encourage today? Who could I help today? Who, who needs a lift? You know, sometimes you, you can just look around and you can see people who really need something. And, and it touches your heart enough that you say, I'm, I'm going to do something to make a difference for that person. And sometimes those people walk right by and you completely miss it. And they're desperate for somebody to care. And you have an opportunity to be that person. Um, do you... Does anybody know what the five love languages are? Has anybody read the book, Five Love Languages? Okay, some of us have. Anybody name them? Physical touch. Okay, physical touch. Words, yes. of, affirmation. Words of affirmation. Gifts. Yes. Personal service. Personal service. Personal service. Personal service. Words. Quality, Quality time. Quality time. Yes. You got them. If you don't know them, you might want to jot those down. Actually, go ahead and write them down anyway. If you have, you've got a piece of paper, um, if you prefer to use your phone, that's fine too. Um, but just jot those down. We're going to watch a video, and they're going to be part of the video. So if you don't remember them, they're going to show up, and they'll be numbered. So that'll help you. So well, let's watch this. With loss of words We used to hide behind closed doors Or put up walls between us And oh how we misunderstood love A whole other language we'd have to learn Not always easier said than done Oh, but now we know better cause If love is a language, I'll use words is a gift, I'll give till it hurts Love's affection, I'll move closer To be only yours Love is time, you have all mine Love is to serve, I'll wait by your side And I'll always find a way Understood love, a 
Loss of affection with loss of words We'd run and hide behind closed doors Or put up walls between us Not always easier said than done With a whole lot of language we have to learn And just to steer us back on course Yeah, but now we know better cause Love is a language, I'll use words If love is a gift, I'll give till it hurts If love's affection, I'll move closer To be only yours if love is time, you have all mine if love is to serve, I'll wait by your side And I'll always find a way To say I love you more With a touch Same language And I love you more On the call Every tick Every chance you That I give Love you more okay. It's not just about marriages though The five love languages Are important in a in a married relationship, but they're important in every relationship because it's how we relate to one another. So, um, on your piece of paper, um, I want you to think, or wherever you took notes, um, I want you to think about somebody that you know that each one of these, just one person for each one of them, that this would be their primary love language, the primary way that they, and you're going to know because that's the way they treat you. That's what they do for you. A person who's always giving you gifts, for instance, probably um, doesn't, doesn't get as much out of your words as they would get if you would give them a gift, um, or vice versa. A person who's always encouraging you with words, and you want to keep buying them gifts, you know, their gifts might be re-gifted, or go on a shelf, or um, don't mean as much to them because they want to hear you verbally <laughs> say uh, <coughs> how you feel about them. So, so, are you writing? Are you thinking? Words of affirmation, physical touch, acts of service, gifts, quality time. Okay, and while you're thinking, while you're writing, do you know what yours is? Do you understand which one of these probably you're more apt to use towards somebody else and which one means the most to you coming back. Doesn't, I mean, I'll take all five. But, you know, there, there's one probably that primarily is, is your, um, your love language. Darnell, do you know yours? Yeah. What is it? It's uh, words of affirmation. That would make sense. You can see that. Tabitha? Physical touch. Amber? Um. <laughs> Not physical touch. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I've had a tie between words of affirmation and quality time. Okay. Lisa? Yes, Tammy? Tammy? I'm an all five kind of person. <laughs> Charlotte, do you know? Um, words of affirmation and quality time. Jen? Um, kind of tied between physical touch and acts of service. Jason? Acts of service. That works. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. More of a out of service than gifts. Victoria? Quality time. Isaac? Mm -hmm. That wasn't one of them. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know? Don't know? You'll figure it out. <laughs> Joe? Quality time. Any area? Quality time. <laughs> There you go. <laughs> Zach? Mm. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Amy? Oh, 
album. Howdy. Chris? Sorry. <laughs> Words of affirmation. So what do you think mine is? You have a boat. It's water. Yeah. I said words of affirmation. service and physical touch. Oh, wow. So, there you go. You know I'm hugging everybody every Sunday. <laughs> Nobody gets away even if you don't like to be hugged. I'm used to it. It's been three years. So, now you've heard what everybody else says, right? And you remember them all. And now you've heard everybody's name. So, no excuse for not knowing anybody's names now, Chris. Um, <laughs> I'm just kidding. So, this helps, this should help us relate to one another here. If you, if you, if people really matter enough to you, to you for you to know this about them, what what really matters to them? What really would be effective to them? How can I really impact their life or how can I really build a relationship with them? Just to know this simple thing, this one simple thing about them. It's not going to take very much to build a relationship with Maria or with Tammy or with Amy because they said all five. So um, just pick one. <clears throat> But also, um, if you, if you, because it's really, you know, even the commercial for the book says that this is, you know, helping to build marriages. It's so much more than marriages. Um, the people that you work with or in school with or your neighbors, they, you need to know this about them. You need to, and you probably can find it out. I mean, you don't have to go up and say, okay, here's a list of five things, which one's yours. Um, it's, it's usually pretty obvious. I mean, you can usually tell because that's the way they're going to treat you is the way they want to be treated. Um, so, so it's important for us to, to build our relationships like this. Um, so if you're interested in, in any more of that, you can get the book, Five Love Languages, if you haven't read that yet. And, um, and check that out. This was not a, a commercial for a Five Love Languages book, um, but I guess it turned into that. I said, there's a quiz. Mm -hmm. Oh, there's a quiz. That's a test. Yeah. It helps you determine which one is yours. Mm -hmm. It's not that hard, <laughs> but okay. <laughs> yeah. It's, but you could do it like in a group setting. Mm -hmm. We could do that. If anybody was interested, we could do that as a group. We would love to do that. We'll get the books and we can all get together. And, and for those of you, you know, that quality time isn't your thing. And, Words aren't your thing, you won't want to come. Um, <laughs> the rest of you. <laughs> if it'll help, we'll be glad to do that. That would be cool. Um, I, I want to I close um, today by reading a scripture from um, the book of Acts, chapter 4. Because some of us, this, this stuff just kind of passes over us and we think, well, what's the big deal? Um, but it really does, if, if you're going to, if you're going to make a difference in your world, if you're going to really stand out as a person who makes a difference to the people who are around you, this needs to matter because they need to matter. Um, Acts 4.36, 
talks about Joseph. Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles called Barnabas, sold the field he owned and brought the money and put it at the apostles' feet. Um, they, they, his name was Joseph, but the apostles called him Barnabas. How rude. <laughs> Please don't call me Barnabas. 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 Okay, so what does Barnabas mean? Son of Consolation. Son of Consolation. What does Consolation mean? The prize you get when you didn't win the first prize. <laughs> <laughs> no! <laughs> oh, here, let me smooth over your head. Okay, Amber, you're not the winner today, but you'll go home with something. <laughs> We, we, we can't give you any quality time, but we'll hug you. You're going to get something before you go. You're not going to get what you want, but you're going to... So when you console someone, when you're... The other word, actually, for consolation in this scripture is encouragement. Son of encouragement. Um, so they actually named the guy this. I mean, he was known for it. He was known for being the person who who was the encourager, and I mean, look what he did. He sold property and brought the money and gave it to them. How encouraging is that? Any of you want to follow his lead, feel free. Um, uh, it, it's, it's something that wasn't just something he, he did on occasion. Obviously, this was a way of life for him because it's what he became known for not only known for encouraging, but known as encouragement. They named him that. They called him encouragement, like that. <laughs> that smile, I love that. Um, they called him encouragement. So, um, so maybe I guess it might be okay to call me Barnabas if, if I was an encourager. Um, one more scripture that I want us to read together um, Amy's going to put it on the screen, and I want us to read it out loud together. It's, will you read it with me? See to it, brothers and sisters, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God, but encourage one another daily, as long as it is called today, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. Now, if if you think that encouragement isn't important, I want to tell you that it is. Because the opposite of being encouraged in our faith, now this is for us in this room, okay? This isn't, this isn't, this verse is talking about us. Um, it's really easy for us, the life that we live, um, the people that we're surrounded by, the um, the influences that are constantly bombarding us generally aren't saying um, live for Jesus, do good, um, love your neighbor. Most of the influences that come from outside are saying the opposite of that. Jesus who? Serve yourself. Um, you know, get revenge anytime anybody does anything to you. But this verse says that we should encourage one another so that our hearts aren't deceived, so that we aren't pulled away by the deceitfulness of sin that says it's better out there than in here, that it's better to live a life apart from God than to, to live for Him. Um, and what we do in this place, the reason it's important for us to know each other well enough to... Um, to relate in a way that matters. Um, the reason that it's important for you to matter to me and for you to matter to each other is because we don't want one person who comes to Transformation House to be outside of that spiritual influence that tells them the truth of who they are, that they are loved by God, and that God's plan for them is better than any plan they ever thought of for themselves. And that, that together we can we can live a life that changes our world. As Chris said this morning, we want to see our city changed. 
Um, I love Greenville. I love what it is. I love what's happening. I love the growth. I love the restaurants. <laughs> love the parks. Um, but I would love to see Greenville be the most different city in the world. And not because, you know, we're Bob Jones or because we're the Bible Belt or because we have the Liberty Bridge, but because we're a city that's loving and accepting, it's encouraging, where, where people can thrive, where they can see their dreams fulfilled, where they can... Seriously, I... Can you imagine that kind of community? The kind of community that really, that really supports one another? Um, I know some of you have been praying this week for Lucinda. Um, she went to the doctor. You remember we prayed for her last Sunday. Um, she was going to her heart doctor this week to make sure she was okay for surgery later on for the cancer that she has. Um, and the, it was a good visit with her heart doctor. Um, surgery is scheduled um, the end of April. March. March, March 3rd. Okay, that's next week. Okay, so we're going to keep praying for her. Um, and um, prayer isn't one of those five love languages because everybody gets in on prayer. Everybody needs it, and everybody needs to do it. Um, so I want to encourage you to pray for Lucinda this week. Um, but, but whatever the need is that you have, like that, it might be it might be a surgery that's coming up, or it might be a financial need. It might be a marriage or a relationship issue that, um, that's really a struggle for you. Or maybe it's turmoil over something you've done or something that's been done to you. Um, some of us are living in victory, and we want somebody to stand with us and, you know, wave the flags and celebrate with us in good times, too. It's not just about standing with people when times are rough. So um, that's why we're here. That's why we have a church. That's why Jesus established a church for us to do that for one another. Um, so, so I hope that Transformation House isn't just a, you know, a couple hours on Sunday morning where we get together and sing some songs and eat some cake and give a hug and go on our way. But it's really a place that that helps you, that that stands with you in good times and bad times. And, and it's, we want to be there. Um, now, we kind of have to know that there's an issue. You know, we had some people leave Transformation House, um, I guess over a year ago now because we didn't visit them in the hospital when they were in the hospital. Of course, we didn't know they were in the hospital. They didn't bother to tell us. They just posted on Facebook after it was all over that we didn't come see them. Um, you know, we have to communicate. Even if words aren't your thing, you've got to use them once in a while. <laughs> there are ways. You don't even have to say it out loud. You can put it in writing. You can mail it. You can send it on Facebook to, or text it to us, however you get us the news. But we need to know what's going on in your life in order for us to be there to help, right? Um, so, got it? Make sense? Okay. So, on your paper, you wrote down, or you were supposed to write down, people's names beside the language, love languages that you think that might be their primary. Since that person came to your mind, even if it was just one or two of them, or even if you haven't thought of anybody now, you've heard some today, so you know some of them. Um, would you make an effort just this week? Maybe you don't actually, I mean, I don't know if it's even possible for you to do anything. Um, but think of ways that you can, maybe like the next time you see this person, something that you can do or say, or if you just need to be there, or if you just need to stay away, if they're that kind of person. Um, so, <laughs> that, you know, some people don't like clingy, and that's okay. Um, 
But a way that you can help those people, and then, I mean, that's your homework for this week. You know, this series, we've had homework every week, so your homework for, for next week is, uh, for this next week, is for you to think of ways that you can put these into practice. These, like, blood languages, okay? Got it? Yeah. Okay. All right, let's pray together.